Okay, so a couple of announcements before we get started today. Uh, first of all, you're probably wondering about your tests. Um, I plan on handing them back on Wednesday. Um, I'm sure I'll have uh, grades posted to eCampus before Wednesday. So just watch your email in the announcement section uh, of eCampus. Uh, they should be posted. I'll probably work on them this afternoon, to be honest. So don't be surprised if grades are up this afternoon. Um, also remember that uh, next week is another week when we have, for some reason, they schedule days off right in the middle of the week, uh, which means next week we will not have lab. Uh, this week, however, now I don't know, I haven't taught this lab since before the pandemic, since we had to split the labs into two groups, but even before the pandemic, this was one of the labs that took a while. Um, so like, I'm, I'm sure Dr. Williams last semester uh, changed it around so it doesn't take as long, but do try to get the lab on time this week because uh, this week's lab, at least when I taught it before the pandemic, it took a while. Um, also, this is the lab that your second and final lab report is gonna be on. So this is one, and, and this is one that takes a lot of setup too. So it's one that you don't wanna miss. So do please do try to be in lab this week on time and your second lab report, your second and final lab report uh, will be due on this lab. Um, for those of you in my lab section, again, uh, I'll try to get the, uh, the videos. I don't think Dr. Mitchell has sent me the videos for this week, I'll have to ask him, but um, I'll try to get the videos off of Amanda or, or Dr. Mitchell and the quiz and, and get that posted as soon as possible. Oh, also quizzes. Remember that we're back on our regular quiz schedule uh, Wednesday and Friday. So there's no quiz today. Uh, Wednesday's quiz will be on today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture. And then Friday's will be just to be on Friday's lecture. Okay, I think that is about it. Let's get back to basic metabolism. Oh. Give me a second. Let me just get the chat up here on screen so I can see if anybody from Zoom is, has anything to contribute. Okay, so when we left off last time, we were just talking about some basic terms used in uh, metabolic reactions. So. Uh, we have reactants. Reactants are the things that enter a metabolic reaction. Um, in this example below, A plus B going to B, pardon me, A plus B going to AB going to C. A plus B are the reactants that are entering the reaction. Um, an intermediate is any molecule that forms during a metabolic reaction. So in this case, uh, AB in the center here are the intermediates in this very simple metabolic reaction. A product is a molecule produced at the end of the metabolic reaction. C would be the product. And also we have a, a special term for something that's acted upon by an enzyme. So something that's acted upon by an enzyme is called the substrate. So let's say that this reaction, A plus B going to AB, is catalyzed or sped up by enzyme number one. And the second reaction, AB going to C, that's catalyzed or sped up by, by enzyme number two. Then A and B would be the substrates for enzyme one. And the intermediate AB would be the substrate for enzyme number two. And that is just a horrible color. Not showing up very well. Okay. Okay, so again here we can see reactants on the left-hand side of the equation, uh, products on the right-hand side of the equation. So in this case, uh, we have two molecules of hydrogen on the left, one molecule of oxygen on the left as well. These are the reactants, uh, the products, are two H2O molecules, the two water molecules. Yeah. Um, there's something else that I want to introduce to you 
here that's illustrated very well, I think, in this particular slide. And that's something called the law of conservation of mass. the law of conservation of the mass. And the law of conservation of mass states that we neither gain nor lose mass in a chemical reaction. We neither gain nor lose mass in a chemical reaction. In other words, when we look at the equation for a chemical reaction, we're going to see the same number and type of atoms on the left-hand side of the equation as on the right-hand side of the equation. So, uh, same number and type types, I guess. Same number and types of atoms. On both sides of the equation. conservation of mass states that we have the same number and types of atoms on both sides of the equation. So let's go back to the PowerPoint slide. Okay, so let's look at the left and right hand sides of the equation here. So on the left hand side, we have two hydrogen molecules containing two hydrogen atoms each. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms on the left-hand side total. Over here, we have two molecules of water with two hydrogen atoms each. So we have four hydrogen on the left-hand side, four hydrogen on the right-hand side. Okay, over, over here, left-hand side, we have one oxygen molecule containing two oxygen atoms. Right-hand side, we have two water molecules with one oxygen atom each. So again, two oxygen atoms on the left, two oxygen atoms on the right. Okay, so again, this is the law of conservation of mass. This means that chemical equations are always balanced. Okay, same number and type on both sides of the equation. Okay, getting back to more basic terms, I've already talked about an enzyme, so you should probably already know that an enzyme is a protein that speeds up metabolic reactions or add, acts as a catalyst. So an enzyme helps to make chemical reactions go faster. Um, in almost all cases, enzymes are going to be proteins. Um, however, that's not always the case. In some rare cases, uh, we have uh, RNA that acts as enzymes, but that's rare and we're not going to talk, we're not going to address that much in class. So for the purposes of this class, an enzyme is a protein that speeds up metabolic reactions. And we're really not going to talk about ribozymes or the ones that are made out of RNA. A cofactor is a molecule that assists an enzyme, often by carrying electrons, hydrogens, or functional groups. Okay. Uh, hopefully by now you've uh, picked up on the fact that uh, lowercase e with a negative charge indicates an electron. So 
So the often uh, my here in elective course H is the chemical symbol for hydrogen. So often by carrying the cysteine enzyme, often by carrying electrons, hydrogens are functional groups. Some examples of coenzymes that we see in uh, metabolism are uh, NADP. Okay, we see this in photosynthesis. Uh, NAD, uh, we see this in aerobic respiration and FED, we see in aerobic respiration as well. Energy carrier provides energy for energy requiring reactions. So again, this is something we, we kind of talked about already. Uh, you've probably heard me say that as far as a cell is concerned, ATP equals energy. Okay, ATP is the energy currency of the cell. So ATP contains high energy bonds that can be broken in order to do work in the cell. Okay, sometimes this work is to uh, drive reactions that require a net input of energy. Sometimes, like we talked about last, last chapter, the energy from ATP is used to do active transport. In other words, to transport something across a membrane against its concentration gradient. Okay. But in both of these cases, we need energy from a molecule from an energy carrier. Oftentimes that energy carrier is ATP. Okay, so a metabolic pathway is an ordered sequence of enzyme mediated chemical reactions. So again, if we use the example on the earlier slide, so A plus B going to A, B. All right, I am not sure. There's that same problem again. Sorry about that. So A plus B going to AB going to C. Uh, if the first reaction is catalyzed by enzyme one, the second reaction is catalyzed by enzyme two. That's a simple metabolic reaction. We have two types of metabolic reactions. We have anabolic pathways and catabolic pathways. Um, anabolic pathways are biosynthetic, meaning that in biosynthetic reactions, we're building large high energy molecules out of smaller, lower energy ones. Uh, meaning that these are endergonic. Um, I think we covered the terms endergonic and exergonic a long time ago. Endergonic reactions require a net input of energy. So we, we need something like ATP or the energy from sunlight to drive that reaction forward. They're energy in. Okay. Uh, a way to think about this is Let's say you're, uh, you're building a shed in your backyard, right? So you, you go to Lowe's, uh, you get some concrete to pour concrete for the floor, you get shingles for the roof, you get uh, some two by fours to frame it, you get some uh, plywood to, to, for the walls. Um, but when you put all these, so you get these delivered to your backyard. When you get these delivered to your backyard, you know, that's, that's not a shed yet, right? In order to make that into a shed, you have to put energy in, right? You have to start swinging a hammer, you have to start pouring concrete, you have to put energy in in order to make that, make these smaller, lower energy pieces into a, into a bigger, more organized structure. Okay, so that's like, a, a, that's like what an anabolic pathway is. We're taking all these pieces, putting energy in, and making bigger, higher energy molecules out of them. A catabolic pathway is the opposite. Catabolic pathways are degradative, meaning we're breaking down large molecules into small, low energy ones. These are exergonic reactions. In other words, we get energy out. So th this we're doing the opposite. So for, for catabolic reactions, we're breaking down large high energy molecules and using the energy that we get out. Okay, in the case of living things, we're gonna use that energy to you know, make proteins, to do active transport, to basically to, to fight against entropy, right? In order to maintain order and keep living. All right, now one of, 
One way I like to remember the difference between anabolic and catabolic pathways is, well, the way I do it, at least, everybody has different ways of remembering things. Uh, the word anabolic, what, what do people do with anabolic steroids? Anybody know? So. Yeah, so it, I mean, anabolic steroids are enhancing, uh, performance enhancing drugs, right? So when people take them, they bulk up and they get bigger and stronger. So that's the that's kind of the same thing. So with, with anabolic pathways, we're building. We're, we're building things up, making bigger, higher energy molecules. So that's, that's kind of one way to, to remember it. And then catabolic is the opposite. Okay, and let me just address these two examples before I move on. So an example of an anabolic pathway is photosynthesis. We'll, we'll cover pho photosynthesis in a lot of detail uh, next chapter. But in photosynthesis, we're taking small, low energy molecules, specifically CO2 and oxygen, and using the energy from sunlight, we're making bigger, higher energy molecules. Okay, we're, we're making glucose that can then be used to make even more bigger and more complex molecules. So glucose we can use to make starch, we can use glucose to make cellulose, et cetera, disaccharides, a whole bunch of stuff. Then we have catabolic pathways. So aerobic respiration is a catabolic pathway. In aerobic respiration, aerobic respiration is, is essentially the opposite of photosynthesis. In aerobic respiration, we're taking big high energy molecules like, like the glucose and starch and breaking it down into small, low energy molecules like CO2 and oxygen. Okay? And we're using the energy that we get out uh, in order to, uh, to do metabolism, again, and to do things like making proteins, like uh, active transport, et cetera. Okay, so here's some examples of two types of reactions we've talked about already. Um, a condensation reaction. So in condensation reactions, we take small, low energy molecules, uh, we make a water, and we, um, we end up with a bigger, higher energy reaction. Does anybody know, in terms of endergonic or exergonic, are condensation reactions endergonic or exergonic? So if we're taking two smaller things and making a bigger thing, what do you think? Endergonic, okay? So we, we need to put energy in to do this. So this would be, um, Anabolic pathways, uh, the reactions that make up anabolic pathways uh, tend to be endergonic. And, okay, in other, in other words, you're putting energy in to make making bigger things out of smaller subunits. Down below, we have a hydrolysis reaction. So in hydrolysis reactions, uh, we start out with, in this case, we're starting out with the disaccharide sucrose uh, in a hydrolysis reaction. Uh, we consume a molecule of water and we have two monosaccharides over here. So this reaction, would you think this would be endergonic or exergonic? If we're starting with something big and ending with two smaller things. Exergonic, okay, this exergonic, energy out. So this would be the type of reaction that's characteristic of uh, catabolic pathways. So in catabolic pathways, we're breaking down big high energy molecules and getting energy out. Okay, so here's some basic term, again, some, uh, some basic um, sort of enzyme kinetics here. Um, if we graph the amount of energy on a graph, so the x-axis, we're looking at the amount of energy that's in uh, a molecule, and then looking at the, the rate of the reaction, or the course of the reaction, or this could be time also on the, on the x-axis. So the course of the reaction or time on the x-axis. Um, on the y-axis, we're gonna, we're gonna plot free energy. 
Now, free energy usually is abbreviated uppercase G. Okay, uppercase G stands for, all right, I'm gonna try to write with the mouse again, hopefully it doesn't freak out on me. This stands for Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free. <laughs> okay. Again, my penmanship isn't very good with the mouse, but at least it didn't freak out on me this time. So G stands for Gibbs free energy. And the, the definition of Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy in a molecule available to do work. Let me write that down on the board. I'm not going to get that written with the mouse, I'm sure. Gibbs free energy for G is the amount of energy available to do work. All right, so if we have reactants, so the reactants would be up here. If we have reactants, let me change that color. I'm just going to abbreviate what reactants are. If we have reactants with high free energy, and we have products with low free energy over here, then the change in free energy, which is this value here, is negative. Okay. Now, whenever there's a change in something, usually we denote that by the Greek lowercase, uh, pardon me, Greek uppercase letter delta. So change in free energy is denoted as delta G. That's a really awful looking G, but that should be an uppercase G. <laughs> Let me try to make that a little better. Delta G. Now over here, if we have uh, reactants with low free energy and we have products with high free energy, the difference between the free energy in the reactants and the products is positive. So when we have a negative delta G, that means we have an exergonic reaction. Okay. And exergonic reactions tend to happen spontaneously. So uh, a good analogy for this, if we look at the, the rolling ball on the left-hand side, so uh, the rolling ball up here, that would be, that would represent the reactants, which have a, froth, a high free energy. Just like the reactants have high free energy, a ball up on a hill, would have a high potential energy, right? 
and it would, it would tend to roll downhill spontaneously. And as it rolls downhill, we're, we're getting kinetic energy out, extra value, they get their energy out. So it's kind of the same, same thing. So uh, chemical reactions, again, when they're exergonic, uh, they're going to head, tend to happen spontaneously, just like a, a ball can spontaneously roll down a hill. And we're going to get energy out. Okay, we're going to go going from a, a high energy state to a low energy state in both of these. Um, down below for an endergonic reaction, if we start out with reactants with low free energy, products that have high free energy, we have to push that ball uphill, right? Pushing that ball uphill, we're, we're putting energy in. So it's the same thing as for a, a pushing a ball uphill is pretty much the same thing as driving an endergonic reaction forward. Okay, in order to get from the reactants to the products, we need to put energy in to, to push that up the hill. Right? And again, we're, we're, we're going to get the energy to drive that reaction forward, either from ATP, okay, again, which is the energy currency of the cell, or maybe some other source like sunlight, or uh, say a, a proton concentration gradient. We'll, we'll get to that later. Okay, so that's exergonic versus endergonic. Um, endergonic reactions uh, tend to happen spontaneously and we get energy out. Endergonic reactions do not happen spontaneously and we need a net input of energy to drive them forward. Okay. Exergonic reactions, negative delta G. Endergonic reactions, positive delta G, meaning we need to put energy in. Everybody good with that so far? Okay, good. Okay, so this is an example. Um, this is glycolysis, which is one of the main metabolic pathways in aerobic respiration. So again, so this is a, a, a catabolic pathway. We're breaking down glucose. Let's just look at some of the reactions here. So here, in the second step, that's catalyzed by the enzyme phosphofructose isomerase, um, we have a delta G of plus zero, plus 0 0.4. Um, so this reaction, is that reaction an endergonic or an exergonic reaction? If it has a, a positive delta G. Endergonic, right? P positive delta G equals endergonic. Let's look at the step three, the one right next to it. Um, so phosphofructokinase is the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. And we have uh, a delta G of negative 3.4. Is that exergonic or endergonic? Exergonic, yeah. Negative delta G equals exergonic. Good. Okay, so uh, most metabolic reactions are reversible. They can proceed in both directions. Okay, so here we can see it's actually, so when I drew the, uh, that metabolic reaction before, I drew single-headed arrows. It's actually more accurate to, dry, to draw double-headed arrows because they can proceed in both directions. All metabolic reactions follow the law of conservation of mass. They are always balanced. The same number uh, of each type of atom occurs on both sides of the arrows. No atoms are gained or lost, just rearranged. Okay, so I talked about this earlier. Uh, this is this is the law of conservation of mass. Okay, so we always have the same number and types of atoms on the left and the right hand side of the equation, and we neither gain nor lose any. We just rearrange them. Okay. Now I have an animation. Um, I'm gonna see if I can play it for you. Uh, unfortunately, the flash animations I've used in the past are a little harder to use now because uh, flash is no more. Uh, but I did find a flash emulator that I think I could use and I downloaded these animations. Just give me a second to see if I can get this to work. All right, 
reference my order. No kidding. Only everything worked out easily. Well, I, I shouldn't shouldn't count my chickens before they're hatched. This might uh, mess up on me still. But let me share this with the jewelers. All right. Um, I'm going to warn you before we watch this animation. There are some mistakes in this animation. So let's see if you can figure them out as I as we go through it. We need symbols or elements for writing dolphins for chemical compounds. For example, water has a formula H2O. Now let's Okay, um, so what they explain there, the subscripts tell you exactly how many of that atom are in that molecule. So for example, uh, glucose has six carbons, uh, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. Uh, the number before a chemical equation tells us how many of that molecule we have. So six molecules of water, each molecule of water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. So we can multiply six times two to get 12 hydrogens in each water, six times one oxygen for six oxygens. Okay. Now I mentioned before we saw this animation that there's a problem with it. Anybody see what the problem is? All right, well, tell you what, let's look at this equation a little closer and see if it's balanced. Remember, according to the law of conservation of mass, we should have the same number and types of atoms on each side. Um, so over here, uh, we have a CO2, each CO2 has one carbon, six times one, six carbons on this side. Over here, we have one glucose, six carbons in the glucose, six carbons. So is this equation balanced with respect to carbons? Yeah. yeah, of course. Let's look at hydrogens. So 12 H2O, so that's uh, H2Os have two hydrogens each. Uh, 12 times two is 24 hydrogens. So that's right. Uh, over here, we've got uh, 12 hydrogens per glucose, 12 here. Uh, again, six times two is 12, 12 and 12 is 24. Is a balance with respect to hydrogens? Yes. yes. Let's look at oxygens. So uh, six CO2, that's six times two, 12 oxygens here. Um, 12 times one, 12 oxygens here. Six H2O, six oxygens here. Is that balanced? That is not balanced. Okay. So this is, uh, these animations are good, but th there are some mistakes in them. Um, yeah, and this is wrong. Uh, actually, over here on this side of the equation, um, we're missing oxygen. So um, if you, you guys have probably heard of the, the, the rainforests in South America being called the lungs of the world because they make oxygen. Well, that's what they forgot. They forgot the part where you actually make oxygen. So they should, there should be a, a plus 602 here in order to balance this equation. Okay, I add 602 and that's, that's uh, wait a minute, uh, six oxygens, 602 is 12 more. That's still not balanced, is it? We need more O2 than that. Okay. Uh, but anyway, that's what they forgot. They, they forgot. they forgot to add the O2 um, in order to balance out the, this equation. So just remember that. Um, I'll post these, on e oh, I posted them on eCampus already. I'll post a link to this emulator so you could watch these animations um, if you think they'll help you. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. OK, 
Okay, general characteristics of enzymes. Enzymes speed up chemical reactions by lowering activation energy. Activation energy is the energy required to start a reaction. Enzymes are not used up by chemical, chemical reactions and may be reused. Uh, the same enzyme usually catalyzes both the forward and the reverse directions of uh, a reaction. Okay, let me explain something to you on the whiteboard first before we uh, watch that animation. Okay, so again, let's look at a chemical reaction. So let's draw a graph. We have G or Gibbs free energy on the y-axis. Uh, we have the progress of the reaction or time if you prefer on the x-axis. So let's say we have reactants with high free energy. We have products with low free energy. Okay, so again, that's going to, if we look at this, uh, the wall would be rolling downhill, right? So we have a, a negative delta G. And we would think this reaction would be exergonic and would uh, happen spontaneously. However, there's one thing when we looked at these, uh, these graphs below that wasn't included. Even in an exergonic reaction, there's an energy barrier. So even in exergonic reactions, there are energy barriers that have to be overcome before that reaction can proceed on its own. Okay, and that energy barrier right here is known as the activation energy. So E sub A equals the activation energy. All right. So we need to overcome it, but before this exergonic reaction will proceed. We have to put a little bit of energy in to overcome that activation energy. Now we're gonna get that energy back when, when once the reaction can proceed on its own, but we need to put a certain amount of, of, of energy in. The way that enzymes catalyze uh, reactions is by lowering that activation energy. Okay, so if this is the activation energy without enzyme, if we were to add enzyme, let me get a different color to make this clearer. Okay, so in red would be the activation energy with enzyme. So you can see that that little energy hill is going to be smaller when we add an enzyme. Okay, let's have a look at the next animation. Let me just check to see which animation this is. Up 
no reactive structure of metabolic reaction that must be activated. The amount of energy needed to allow reactions to spontaneously proceed to end products is called the activation energy. An enzyme may not change the energy of the reactants or the products, but it can lower the activation energy. Enzymes lower the amount of activation energy necessary to make the reaction proceed. Let's check what you have learned. Print the arrow that represents the energy difference between the reactants and products. Okay, so let's go through this together. So which one of these arrows, the one on the left, the one in the middle, or the one on the right, represents the difference between the difference in free energy between the reactants and the products? Left. Okay, that's this is also what I've been calling delta G, right? The difference between the energy and the reactants and the products is our delta G. That's correct. In this example, the reactant has more energy than the products. Could the arrow that represents the activation energy from the enzyme is present? Okay, so now we have the middle and the right left. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, the, we have the middle and the right remaining. Um, which of these two is represents the activation energy when the enzyme, when the reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme? The right, exactly. We have a lower activation energy when enzyme is added. That's correct. An enzyme lowers activation energy. All right. So that's it for the second animation. Let's go back to the part. Oh, I didn't share this with the people on. I, I apologize for the people joining by Zoom. I forgot to share the animation with you. It is available on eCampus uh, if you want to have a look at it. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so more characteristics of enzymes. Enzymes are very specific. They only recognize specific reactants called substrates. Um, enzymes contain an active site, which is a specific pocket or crevice in an enzyme uh, into which the substrate binds. Okay, so uh, this is what makes enzymes so specific for their substrate. So um, they have very complementary shapes to the substrate, so they fit together very well. And also, uh, they fit together in such a way that uh, some weak intermolecular reactions like, like hydrogen bonds or ionic bonds come into play and they, they hold, they're, they're held in there in this, this very specific crevice by these weak intermolecular uh, forces. All right, we've got another animation, and um, this time I'll remember to share it with those joining by Zoom at home. This one I actually like quite a lot. Enzymes in cells speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy that is needed to start the reaction. In motion activation energy is the hop at the top of a hill. Pushing the rock over the hump requires energy. Once the rock is over the hump, energy is released as the rock rolls to the bottom of the hill. An enzyme lowers the activation energy that is needed to start a chemical reaction. In a rock analogy, the height of the hump is reduced. The amount of energy released, delta G, is the same as before. It is not affected by the reduction in the activation energy, E sub A. In chemical reactions, heat is often used to provide the activation energy. For example, if you put glucose in a test tube, you must heat it to make it start burning in air, which contains oxygen. This reaction releases energy and produces carbon dioxide can be shown in the graph of free energy against time. Remember that free energy is the energy in the system that is available to do work. In a test tube, glucose must be heated well above 100 degrees Celsius to provide the activation energy to start the reaction. If enzymes are present, the activation energy 
energy is much lower. Therefore, in your body, the breakdown of glucose occurs at the normal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius due to the presence of enzymes. There are many different enzymes involved in the catabolism of glucose, but in each case, the enzymes lower the activation energy required. A substrate is a chemical that an enzyme acts upon. Here, we will look at the sugar lactose, which is broken into glucose and galactose by the enzyme lactase. Each enzyme has a specific area called the active site, which fits around the substrate. Energy is needed to bind the substrate and the enzyme together. In this transition state, the enzyme lowers the activation energy in part by holding the substrate in exactly the correct position, putting a slight strain on the substrate. This makes it easy for the substrate to be split into two smaller molecules, and these products are released from the enzyme. Although the enzyme changes its conformation during the reaction, it returns to its original conformation, so the same enzyme can now split apart another substrate molecule. Enzymes themselves are not permanently changed by the reaction, and can go on to facilitate reactions again and again. In fact, some can break apart over 100,000 molecules per minute. Not all enzymes break molecules into smaller products. Some enzymes join two substrates together to produce a larger molecule. Okay, there's actually quite a lot of good stuff in this, uh, this animation. So if we go back, um, they mentioned that breaking down glucose by combusting it into water and CO2, if we were to do that in the test tube, we'd have to heat it to over 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, this is basically the same reaction that, uh, that we do in aerobic respiration. Uh, when we metabolize glucose, we break it down into CO2 and water. Um, so we, we, we're base, our bodies basically burn glucose, exact same reaction. However, our, our normal body temperature in Celsius is only 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so how do we do it? Well, instead of doing it all in one step like this, it's broken down into many smaller steps. And each of those steps is catalyzed by an enzyme to lower the activation energy. Okay, so in this way, uh, our bodies can do essentially the same reaction um, at 37 degrees that would have to be done uh, in a test tube at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. And here, this animation, I think it really showed really well how uh, the active site is complementary to the substrate and how the substrate fits uh, into the active site and then the active site catalyzes the reactions. Now, sometimes uh, there'll be only one reactant other times, like, uh, where's the last one? Here, sometimes there's two reactants entering uh, the reaction, and the active site will bind both of those uh, reactants and, and catalyze the reaction. Okay. All right, looks like we're about out of time, so I'll stop here. So remember, um, no lab next week. Uh, lab this week might run a little late, try to be there on time. Um, I'm planning on handing back your exams on Wednesday. Look for the grades to be posted earlier than that, possibly as early as this evening. Um, and I think that's all the announcements I had today. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday morning. And if there's no questions from those joining uh, by Zoom today, I'm going to end the meeting here.